Chris is wondering if he's next. Yes, you can stay in the podium. <laughs> okay, so as you can see, the next speaker is Chris Sander, who is currently at the Computational Biology Center Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, USA. And I mean, to try to make it short, I mean, he trained as a theoretical physicist. I think you were first working on elementary particles. And then after a number of meetings, including reading the work of Sanger and other things, slowly he became what you can say a structural biologist, a sequence analyst, and so on. I mean, you know a lot of things he did in bioinformatics, including the first, I think, foreign bioinformatics is work he did with CAPTCH, the DSSP algorithm, I mean, which was more an algorithm first than a database, I mean, to compute the secondary structure from tree structures that led to HSSP. So it was also work of genome analysis at the time of the genome sequence of yeast and set of bacteria that led to gene quiz. What people, that you can see easily through his publication. What you cannot see from his publication is that he was one of the person behind MNET and which pushed for the creation of MNET. And that, I think, is not really well known. And he is editor of bioinformatics, among all of other things. As geolinks, I put Berlin, Berkeley, Rehovot, I think it's what's in this order. Then Heidelberg, I think you went back and forth. I mean, Heidelberg, Rehovot, Heidelberg, and Heidelberg EMBL, that's where bioinformatics, uh, so bioinformatics career of Chris started. Inkston, EBI, Boston, where he was at Millennium, and New York. So I made only a small section of BioLinks because Chris has published so many papers with so many people, but Lisa, he has published a lot with Lisa Holm and worked a lot with her, with Ronald Schneider, with Pierre Bock, Alfonso Valencia. You recognize all these crews. Uh, I mean, there is this Swiss mafia we're hearing a lot during this meeting, and there is the EMBL, uh, Heidelberg mafia, with all of the people which came up from the groups of Chris, of Pat Argos, of Pierre Bock, and so on. Chris Osozunis, Burkhard Ross, Georg Kazari, and of course, one from Kapsch. Now, every time I, gave, I was in a meeting and I started a talk, I was saying, you know, I'm going to speak about sequence analysis. And Chris said, Amos, Amos, it's analysis. And, I mean, do you have your... Yeah. I mean, do you have all your conference bag? <laughs> do you, I mean, can people look at your conference bag? Uh, you will see, look, I mean, people, if you have your conference bag, I'm serious, look at it. Have you noticed that the person which did the bag had to spend a full night because what happened due to clerical error, it was typing Anna, I don't know how you would pronounce this. I mean, <laughs> yeah. So there was somebody which spent a night typexing the Y, I mean, to put an I in it. So, I mean, when I saw that, I thought, oh, this I should tell Chris because uh, the word, no, nothing with Chris, he enjoys life. You can see him in Waterville Valley dancing with Nana Robinson, who is not the wife of uh, Michael Rivska. Michael, don't go in and... And, <laughs> and uh, so, thanks, Chris, for being here.
Yeah, that should work. Great. So actually, we're doing a pretty big job. Actually, the one, the one tiny thing. I actually, you know, talking about names and things changing and so on. The uh, you know the field of computational biology and now systems biology in part. At one point, it was called biocomputing, and I actually started the first department of biocomputing at the EMBL Heidelberg, which contained the data library. And at one point, actually, uh, and this you might call this a minor contribution. It's a little bit like Paolo Zanella not preventing the internet. The head of the data library came to me as chairman of the department and said. Well, you know, we've got this guy and another guy, and they're coming there's this kind of wild Swiss, and they have a protein sequence database, and, you know, and, uh, what do you think we should do? And uh, I really think we should support them. And, uh, and I, s I didn't say no, so that was my contribution to the formation of the Swiss project. Uh, and, but actually, I had a little bit of knowledge. And this came from, uh, actually, before... Swiss code emerged, analyzing protein sequences like nobody's, nobody's business. And this came from the fact that I'd been motivated to, uh, as a physicist, to try to solve a really hard problem, and the problem was protein structure prediction. And I worked at that for a while, and then somebody walked in the door, a paper was published actually, and it had what I realized was the first successful prediction of protein function based on something very, very simple, computational. It was an oncogene called V-cis. They had sequenced it. And then somebody laboriously sequenced another protein, you know, in another universe called PDGF. And when they got the first 10 amino acids of that protein and compared it against V-cis, they realized V-cis was a stolen platelet-derived growth factor, thus explaining the function of one of the first oncogenes. And so I thought, hmm, well, they can do it. I can do that. And, uh, and uh, so I got the best collection of protein sequences at the time, which were LANL, Los Alamos National Laboratory, sent me a little tape, and uh, we typed in every onco onco oncogene protein that was published in HR Science that year, and took a little program that we'd written to scan databases, and my goal was to make discoveries like that, all the oncogenes I wanted to explain by scanning them against the sequence database, pre swiss -Bot. And that was successful prediction, much more successful in some sense than the prediction of protein structure. And so, but then things took over, so I entered the first Swiss broad million, digging around my old email messages, you know, after one year, a million residue is not bad. This sort of merits the situation in the MBL where we had three people sitting in rooms typing in sequences and then sending out tapes and sending out stacks of paper, the MBL data library. Uh, and, uh, but uh, Amos was doing it all in one PC, as you know, anyhow. Then came, 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 came the Emosian chutzpah, actually a year earlier. Uh, he knew I was working on structure, protein, structure, secondary, uh, protein structure prediction and wrote this email message. Yeah, he's this guy. Why in the last eight or nine years has there been no significant new methods? How would I know? I've been working on it, you know? <laughs> Ask somebody else. Anyhow. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, uh, so I recruited Why Not Schneider and Kokrat Rost, and uh, I think in, uh, spurred on by that. We did make some contributions later on uh, on that problem. So, but let me jump to now from protein databases and computations and proteins to networks, which is something that I'm currently interested in. And first, talk about the database aspect of that, which, you know, as you know, are things like that. This is one incarnation of TGF beta pathway that we've done some work on. And uh, so, the idea is to go beyond the individual items. Uh, and uh, perform computation and capture the information around ne networks and pathways and processes and th the way these things change over time and how they're organized in space. And so as a step along that way, realizing that there were too many diverse databases, the situation of pathway database wasn't anything close to the organized beauty and elegance and efficiency of the sequence databases with the DNA or protein sequence databases. So what do you do when there are 220 different databases of pathways? And uh, well, you build another EBI. So you know, hire 300 people, build two buildings, and, and c'est parti, as they say. Well, so we decided to, 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 to initiate and with, with the community, some of the people are in the room, uh, the first step in the direction of something that's affordable to the unifying pathway information. And so this became the pathway exchange format, BioPACS, which is now uh, in its final form. The final draft uh, is out this summer. And uh, what it does basically, it 
solve the problem of multiple communication with an N squared problem on the right by actually having one common language, like a common format, something that you guys have worked in sequences are very familiar with, and something at one point was a huge point of negotiation between the, uh, the EMBL data library and, uh, and GenBank on the US side. Uh, transaction protocols, uniform formats, and so on. It's a bit more complicated for pathways than it is for sequences. So considerable thought with the, you know, interacting in part with computer scientists, including Peter Karp, uh, led to the creation of ontology. Learning also, or taking a page from the book of the gene ontology, Michael Ashburn and colleagues, who of course pioneered some aspects of that in the area of, 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 of gene function. And so this has led to bypass ontology and an exchange format. Now, once that's finished and it's near in completion, and it's already converters that, that convert from databases into this common format, and the first common pools of database information, what we decided to do now is to create a common pool of pathway information, not original contact, not duplicating the great work that Reactome and Keg and PSI and Ecocyc and so on have done, but collecting these diverse collections, some of them overlap, of course, collecting them in a common pool, which we call pathway commons, a uh, shared area, making use of this interchange format. And uh, that's an effort that's on its way, and uh, it's meant to make a, a, a pathway, uh, data, pathway information, network information, process information available uh, from whatever source. Uh, it does not duplicate the kind of things that Reactome or Ecopsych or Keg are doing, and it is under construction. It will need domain experts that work on it, and if you go to the website right now, you see very much that it is under construction. Uh, Gary Bader's uh, uh, sense of humor here. And uh, it will need domain experts to help curate those areas of the pathway databases that are not well curated. It also needs collaboration. Uh, we've made, made a start, and this is a project that I hope will come together as an international collaboration, uh, whatever the individual database groups uh, do. And if a bricks and mortar solution is found and somebody plunks down a building with 300 people and uh, uh, you know, a director called Janet X or something, then, you know, or David Y, that would be great, and then we can do it. Uh, in the meantime, I think it would be wonderful to have this information available in a freely exchangeable form, and uh, that's our goal with Pathway Commons. Now let me give you a scientific topic uh, that relates back to protein structures, protein sequences, but also relates to networks in the following sense. And, 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 uh, uh, Christina Rengo already, uh, and, and, and Janet also uh, alluded to that, uh, which has to do with the ways in which function is encoded on the surface of protein structures and how the way it is encoded in protein sequences. And uh, uh, if you think of protein function as the key expression of biological value of a protein, then what does function mean? Function means interaction with something else. Interaction in context, interaction in certain conditions, interaction that has a physiological consequence such that when a mutation is made that alters that function, and then difficultly the organism dies and, evolution take, and, and evolutionary selection takes place. So function relates very much to the interaction of proteins and other molecules, and we want to capture those interactions and the conditional, the conditional expression in time and space. And so I'll give you one aspect of that that relates very much to the Swiss plot, which has to do the aim, has to do with the aim of, 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 of defining functional subfamilies for a protein family and functional residues that are the characteristic of such a family. Take, for example, and you're all familiar with that, most of you, just a, this Victor Ras family, my, 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 one of my favorite ones, a protein multiple sequence alignment, these are all homologs, actually all, these are all paralogs, all human, human uh, paralogs, quite a, quite, quite a few of them in the human genome. And it's pretty easy uh, to, uh, to, to analyze conservation as conservation pattern. These blue regions are very conserved residues, they're conserved everywhere. And uh, that typically is sort of the analysis of conservation patterns. And uh, do you see much else here in that? Well. Not really, there isn't, well, you can't see this very well with this projector, uh, but there are other subtle, uh, subtle conservation patterns which are not so obvious. So if you think that uh, conserved residues are really the key, the ones in active sites, uh, then think again, and of course many of you know this, uh, not all, all residues are equal, and we discussed that yesterday after Bill Pearson's uh, talk, 
but uh, some residues are more equal than others that some have actually some functional role and there are minorities that clearly claim that they should be on the map more prominently. So our goal is to exploit the evolutionary record that evolution has deposited in sequences. So the NPCN already made some mention of that, I think. Uh, what? It's hard to hear me because I'm going back and forth. Okay, I have to stay close to this. So we want to exploit the evolutionary information that's recorded in the protein sequences. And uh, a key goal is to describe for a given protein family what are the functional subfamilies and what are the key residues the fun that are characteristic for those subfamilies. That's the question. What's the solution? Uh, you take an alignment and uh, you take an alignment. Uh, you start with the, uh, with the conserved residues and then you look for other patterns that aren't so obvious just looking at it. And those patterns would be residues. Now I've, take, I've taken this example here where you don't see very much by eye, by the hood glands, other than the very conserved residues. And I'm giving you here after reordering the lines, that is after clustering these sequences into subfamilies, I'm giving you residues which are conserved in one subfamily, E in family one, E in family two, and then this also conserved in another subfamily, but characteristically different. In family, subfamily three, it's S, and subfamily four, it's V. And similarly here, there's a Q in family one, and R, and E, and L. That of course, again, you're familiar with, if you're familiar with the evolution of protein sequences, specificity expressed in sequences. But if you have something like the PFAM collection, you look at a typical family that has between you know, 50 and 2,000 members, you're not going to be able to sell, uh, sit down. So obviously, this needs an algorithmic implementation. People have worked on that. I won't recount the history of those algorithms, also contribution in my group by Pierre Casari and Alfonso Valencia. But uh, uh, Boris Weber has implemented uh, implemented a new algorithm using an entropy measure. And so what it does basically is an example, it will take a multiple sequence alignment and algorithmically divide it up into subfamilies, number, number of subfamilies undetermined, precisely which sequences in which subfamily are also undetermined, but in the end, what is optimized is this discontinuous conservation pattern, conservation within the subfamily, but then differences, characteristic differences between the subfamily, such as the residues that are around an active site and govern, determine the specificity of interaction uh, with some partner. And so how do you do that? Well, this is how you do it. You define an entropy measure. Here it is. Basically, it's just a difference between two entropies, which is the actual combinatorial entropy, looking down a column, and then some background entropy that you, that you compare in some random situation. And the key thing are these factorials. What you do is in a particular subfamily at a particular position, you simply count the number of ways arranging a particular residue type and then another residue type. And if you add those up, as you know, you get an entropy. And then if you normalize properly and take the right difference, you get a measure to what extent residues in a particular column are organized in the way that I just indicated. And so you have an optimization problem. So, so that is quite easy to do. However, to go through all, to go through all different ways of partitioning a set of sequences into subfamilies, and to, at the same time determine the residues which are characteristic for that decomposition is actually a combinatorially hard problem. And but, as others in the room, uh, uh, one does like to solve hard problems. Look, Mr. Drixer who's sitting in the front row, looking very. And uh, so, so, so we solve that problem in an algorithmic uh, implementation that actually works. It, so it makes a reasonable uh, approximation, algorithmic approximation to a hard problem using hierarchical clustering and optimizing a parameter, which essentially determines the granularity of decomposition into subfamilies. And so at the end of the day, you can actually, so now compared to an earlier method that we had, Alfonso, Valencia, and Gio Casari, and also that of, of, of uh, Olivier Lichtard. This, I don't want to explain this graph, it's like gets, gets too technical, but basically if you take the columns and order them by this combinatorial entropy, you see, compared to some background curve, which is a slope, you see a region which clearly is a specificity region. Some residues are specificity residues, and clearly a region which are very conserved residues. So without any kind of arbitrary cutoff, this actually tells you where evolution has placed the cutoff. Uh, plausibly, and uh, how many residues incorporate at a given level of granularity the specificity of the subgroup 
that is engaged in a certain particular function in the network of interacting protein molecules. And so then you can ask it. So, so you can do this for any protein family, and you can add specificity residues and subdivisions. And uh, then you can check uh, in worked examples where you have the 3D structure, you know a lot about the function, where these actually end up. Here's a worked example. You take a protein complex, you take it apart, you see where the binding site is, and then you take the sequence, you analyze it, the, the multiple sequence alignment, you map the residues onto the 3D structure, then you compare. You compare the binding site and the specificity residues identified from just sequences. And sure enough, in many cases, these two overlap. Indicative of the fact that these specificity residues often are in binding sites. So now you can use these also to predict binding sites, of course. And here's an example of doing that in a protein that has quite a number of interaction partners, as you perhaps know, RAS. And so you take all the entire RAS family, and analyze it this way, and then look at the RAS subfamily, the row subfamily, with their characteristic patterns. You'll see down here, not readable, all the experimentally known. So this is the prediction up here, and this is the experimentally known interactions of RAS in its very interesting regulatory pathway with all the partners for most of these, all of these 3D structure complexes are available. So for most of the specificity residues going left, right, this experimental evidence from 3D structure and other molecular biology experiments actually says that these residues, except for the ones which are white here, are actually involved in functionally interesting interactions. So there's a great deal of overlap between these specificity residues which are given to you, handed to you through the process of molecular evolution visible in the sequence family uh, 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 and you can look at those and interpret them as functional residues, and most, mo most often you'll be right to interpret them that way. And you go to the 3D structure, and then in the case of RAS, a very fascinating story about the way the GTPA switches between the active and inactive state as a result, and then the reloading of DDP and so on. So this is a worked example, uh, and then you get, uh, if, you, if you care, you get the subfamilies all organized. And this now is something you can also use for, for structural genomics. If you want a functional subfamily, Christina Renger talked about that problem, and she has an approach to that, that here, here's, a, here's a way of, imagine, for example, you had enough funds to solve something like 20 crystal structures in this RAS, RAW, RAB universe, part of, part of the protein sequence universe. Well, which 20 would you do? One of each of the boxes. That's what you'd do. And you'd have some covering of sequence space by 3D structures uh, at cost efficiency, which addresses the function of uh, the, the question of functional subdivision, and in that way brings biology into what at some point was a very base level estimate of optimal strategies for structural genomics. So we're proposing this as a way of guiding at least part of the effort in structural genomics. And of course, there are many other ways in which this can be used. And I'll skip this because I'm probably running out of time. How many more time do I have here? What? Another six minutes. Okay. And then five minutes discussion? Okay. Yeah. So here's one ex a worked example, uh, 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 the, uh, an important uh, complex in the cell cycle, CDK2 in cyclin. If you take, this is a crystal structure. If you take this apart, shown at the bottom here, you see that specificity residues, which is shown in red, and the conserved residues in, in blue, actually map on this interface. But you put it back together, this left piece and this right piece, into the complex, and then on the surface of this complex, you see additional specificity residues, and now you can, which must, imp which, which plausibly imply other interesting functional interactions. And so now you can go to town and collaborate with experimentalists or look up the, the known facts to actually further interpret what these are. And we think this is actually quite precise in generating hypotheses for experimentation. Uh, there's another one for DNA binding, and you can turn this into prediction. And uh, now, Boris Reva, who developed this algorithm in my group, and uh, Genia Tipin, who uh, joined this, uh, the group then as a software engineer, took this, uh, implemented this now as a server. And one of the reasons I'm telling you this is that you can actually use it as of today, uh, this server. It's quite well developed, uh, it crashes rarely. Tongue in cheek. So we've taken all the PFAM families. We hope to link this to the to the both the, both the exposy as well as the, to PFAM, so that when you're sitting on a protein, you go to the family, and from the family you go to this analysis or analysis, as some people might have, have it, and then you <laughs> you analyze, and then you can you can actually look up the pre-computed multiple sequence alignment, the subfamilies, the specificity residues, and if it's 3D structure available, and please go and choose which PDB file you want, 
you go and see that map in 3D. And so, in fact, I'll show you one example, uh, 1433, which is a fascinating uh, protein that binds peptides, which also uh, uh, has a role in cancer. Here's, here's the, here's the uh, kind of uh, uh, interface you'd get. If you, go, go, if you run this, you get a protein sequence alignment viewer and a 3D structure viewer, and then you can go and uh, look at the, at, the, at the sequence alignments. The resolution here isn't very good. And what can I, it's, it's a mouse uh, usable anyhow, so I don't think. Uh, anyhow, you get the multiple sequence alignments, you get a re record of the residue types and so on. No time to go into that. And you get a JMOL viewer. In this case, it's absolutely fascinating. If you look at this thing, the, uh, this is actually peptide binding uh, protein. You see the green, the green stuff is, is a peptide, is a peptide. And we first ran this sitting with Mike Yaffe at MIT who works on this. I said, oh, there's no red stuff. The, the orange and red stuff are perseverance. There's no red stuff in this binding site. It, it's only conserved residues. There must be a mistake in the program or you should be counting the, you must have shifted the residue numbers by a certain amount. He said, no, no, wait a minute. It's exactly right. The binding of the 14333 domain is precisely, is, is, is conserved across all the different subfamilies. The specificity is somewhere else. We don't know where it is, where it is. Help us. So we just turned this thing around, and sure enough, on the back, there are about 15 residues which are candidates for these specific interactions, and Mark Yaffe is now going and doing the experiments. Uh, he was already in progress, but now his experiments are becoming much more focused to see what actually is the, it, this, what, what, is the what are the sites of specific interactions of that, uh, of that, uh, of that protein domain 1433. So going back and Finishing up, you can use that server if you want, and uh, and uh, we also have mapped onto a genetic var variation uh, taken, in fact, via SwissProt, bravo, and uh, and so on uh, with a mouse over on these multiple sequence alignments, you can get annotation uh, about these these observed uh, variants and their role in disease. And one of the applications is going to be in the cancer genome sequencing project where there'll be lots and lots of variants sequenced, and people will be looking at these sequences from cancer samples and the, and the variation within them, and they'll be asking themselves, what's the function of this particular variant? And this will help them to the extent that the, that the variant in cancer is amino acid changing, will help them make the interpretation. And, in, in, and, and so cancer is only one problem, the other problem is just general genetic variation in the, in the population, and not just the Swiss, everybody in fact different genomes and different phenotypic implementation, uh, not just different papers written. A human genetic variation is a fascinating biological topic. And so one step in that direction is actually to interpret the consequences of, of point mutations uh, on the function of biological macromolecules and the network interactions and the processes they're involved in. So we're very interested in that topic and are going to continue and hopefully exchange opinions and views with you of how to best do that and collaborate. So with that, I'd like to stop and my acknowledgement go to all the bundle people, the people who have done the work here, and special mention to people who have contributed earlier and whose work I've mentioned. And especially uh, Gary Bader in the Pathway area, who is my partner in the Pathway Commons uh, project. He's now in Toronto, and we're trying to develop this together jointly and also with other groups that are interested. And please see me if you are interested. Thanks very much. Uh, do we have any questions for Chris Sander, please? Okay, there's one here, actually. Uh, have you tried to compare the result of the hierarchical uh, clustering with uh, some tree building methods, uh, phylogenetic tree building methods, to, to see if the order is, uh, follows uh, the evolutionary uh, pathway? Uh, the acoustics is complicated. You can't compare, to compare what we have with what? So when, when you have a multiple sequence alignment and you're using your entropy-based uh, hierarchical clustering to um, bring, I mean, similar patterns together, I mean, a, a very natural alternative way of doing that would be to really to build a phyl phylogenetic tree right. and put the sequence that are close together, right? And so I was just wondering why you don't do that and whether you probably you've tried and what are the differences? That 
that's a longer discussion. I mean, both 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 methods have have have, have pros pros and cons, and uh, uh, I think we have here more flexibility of the way in which we measure the diversity with respect to the properties of the amino acids. Uh, rather than making any assumptions that are implicit in the phy phylogenetic tree. But both methods, I think, are valuable, and uh, if in doubt, both should be tried. Okay, so if there are no more questions, it just remains to thank once again Chris Sunder. <laughs>